right. Um, hi and welcome. Thank you all for coming. Um, we are at the fourth session of the Snake River Alliance's series about the nuclear fuel chain. My name is Ava Traverso. I'm the energy program manager of Snake River Alliance, and I'll be your host tonight. Uh, also with me tonight is Lee Ford, uh, our Snake River Alliance executive director, and Jeremy Cross, our communications <laughs> manager. Uh, they will be helping at question time with any tech support issues or anything like that. Um, first, I'll just get a few things out of the way. Uh, if you submitted a question via email, we will compile similar questions in the interest of time. If you would like to ask, ask a question after the talk, you may use the raise hand function or write your question in the chat. If you would like to verbally ask your question, please keep it to under a minute so everyone has a chance to speak. And then once everyone has had a chance to chime in and there is time remaining, please feel free to ask another question. With these talks, we want to explore the entire nuclear fuel chain. There's been a lot around nu a nuclear renaissance that could help solve the climate disaster. Is that true or another false claim and solution? False solution. Without further ado, I am excited to welcome Deb Katz. Uh, Deb is the Executive Director of Citizens Awareness Network, a nonprofit grassroots New England organization fighting for clean air, democracy, and environmental justice. CAN was instrumental in the closure, closure of reactors in Massachusetts, Vermont, and Connecticut. Katz designed the community health study with the Massachusetts Department of Health organized local community participation and secured pro bono support from Harvard School of Public Health, USGS, Clark University, and John Snow Institute to investigate the epidemic of disease in her community brought on by long-term exposure to radioactive releases from a nuclear power reactor. She coordinated environmental justice tours to Utah, Nevada, Washington, DC, and South Carolina. Three action camps, and National People's Summits on Nuclear Waste. Katz won a giraffe award for sticking out her neck to protect New England reactor communities. The House of Representatives from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts cited her for outstanding leadership and service in the public health field. Katz is an author who published Valley of the Shadow, a picture book on the grief process for the left behind. Deb, thank you for joining us tonight. Well, thank you for having me. So. As you can see from the title, I'm starting with the broken promises of nuclear power. And it's about how to make the invisible visible. So my town was host to the first commercial reactor in America, Yankee Row Reactor. It's four miles from my home. And why our town? Because we're a working poor farming community in Western Massachusetts. The reactor sits on the banks of the Deerfield River that winds through nine small towns in our valley. Many promises were made to my community, many broken. The corporation maintained that the reactor was safe, non-polluting, and that when it shuttered, the site would be returned to unrestricted use and to its former beauty. We knew there were dangers with nuclear power, with the accidents at Three Mile Island and Chernobyl, but those were accidents and we thought we were safe. When lightning struck the reactor in 1991, knocking out the communication with the outside world, citizens began meeting, fearing what could happen if there was an accident. The Union of Concerned Scientists said, if there was an accident, the reactor vessel could shatter like glass releasing radioactive waste into the river. Alarm grew. Meetings overflowed with people. The corp corporation began holding its own meetings in local towns. In a packed school gymnasium, we raised our concerns about an accident, the potential contamination of our river. A chemist from the reactor got up and said, hell, we've been dumping in your river for 30 years. What's the difference? What's the difference? Shock. The river is the lifeblood of our community. Why didn't we know? A group of us started researching what the reactor dumped in the river. 
what we found, it routinely, regularly released radioactive waste where our kids swim, where we fish, boat, in water we used to irrigate crops and drought. Our schools are on the banks of that river. Was this legal? Wasn't it the NRC's job to protect our river, to protect us? Not only did the corporation pollute the river, it cooled the reactor with river water, sucking hundreds of millions of gallons of river water every day, only to return heated water that undermined the river and destroyed aquatic life. And it's legal. Our river didn't matter. We didn't matter. The corporation mattered. This corporation controlled our waterways and our lives. It bought our silence by donating needed services like ambulances, school computers, science classes. People were afraid to speak openly and those that did were threatened and at times hurt. There was a thin veneer of civility hiding a dangerous undercurrent. To this day, the fabric of our community is rent. I lost friends and neighbors alike in this fight. In the face of this, we pulled together to shut row. This was the beginning of Citizens Awareness Network. Then mothers worried about the high rates of children with Down syndrome in our community asked for our help. They said that the Massachusetts Department of Health was refusing to take them seriously. We created a health committee with the mothers, local health professionals, and experts. We learned things we never wanted to know. How radioactive waste released into our river caused cancer, mutations, and birth defects. Not only did it undermine our river, it undermined our lives. We suffered an epidemic of disease with statistical significance in cancers, a tenfold increase in children with Down syndrome, high rates of miscarriage, heart disease, immune deficiency diseases, and children with disabilities. Less than 8,000 people live in our valley. There shouldn't be any statistical significance. And I want to address this for a moment because when it's in the form of statistical significance, that's very abstract. And I wanna talk about the families with children with Down syndrome, because in a decade, there were nine children born and a 10th child that had chromosomal damage. In the decade before, there were at least six children born and, and the health committee tracked these. And you've got to understand part of the health committee were people in the community who themselves were sick. And we had to stop meeting at times because too many people had cancer or other problems. And of these 10 families, two of the mothers had breast cancer. All of them were under 40. One of the fathers died of a brain tumor when he was 39. One of the mothers had multiple myeloma and she lived in a house with a woman who had lived there before died of multiple myeloma. Down syndrome occurs one in a thousand live births. And as I said, there are only 8,000 people in my valley. There shouldn't be any statistical significance. People in my community blame themselves for their illnesses rather than the corporation and its deadly waste. Our community suffered an unbearable assault, but we're not unusual. This is the reality for all nuclear communities. My husband said we paid our electric bills at our medical centers. This is the broken promise of routine operation. We did shut Roe. But before I talk about the cleanup of Roe and the problems that didn't end with Roe's closure, I want to address the nuclear industries and its invisible contamination of communities. So let's talk about tritium as an example. There is concern and opposition to the release of tritium at decommissioning reactors in Massachusetts and New York. 
there's been an outcry concerning the tritium releases from the Fukushima reactors that melted down in an accident brought on by the tsunami in 2011. These releases in Japan will be ongoing for decades. Now, tritium is a radionuclide emitted as waste from nuclear reactors. It has been an integral part of the nuclear weapons industry. Tritium was released into the atmosphere as part of weapons testing in the 50s and 60s. It's a beta emitter, and it has a half-life of 12.5 years. Tritium was to be believed to be a relatively benign radionuclide because of the weakness of the beta radiation admitted when it decays. It readily passes through most barriers. The dangers of tritium come from inhalation, ingestion, and absorption. Now, tritiated water passes through the body in just 12 days. However, when it unites with carbon in the human body, plants or animals, it becomes organically bound, and it can remain in the body for 450 to 650 days. One study found traces of tritium in the body 10 years after exposure. Most information on tritium was developed from animal studies. As tritium makes its way up the food chain, it becomes more concentrated. Pigs fed with tritiated food themselves become tritiated, as did their offspring. The blood, heart, kidneys of the piglets were more tritiated than their mother. Tritium is carcinogenic, mutagenic, and terogenic. Human beings can receive chronic exposure to organically bound tritium through the ingestion of plants and animals, in addition to the direct uptake in terms of inhalation, absorption, and drinking contaminated water. Especially sensitive to the effects of tritium are rapidly growing cells, such as fetal tissue, genetic materials, and blood blood forming organs. So tritium is dense with a short track life. It releases all its activity at once. This makes it more potent. When and where it deposits its radioactivity, it creates at least one lesion in the cell. This lesion may be re must be repaired within 24 hours or the cell will be carcinogenic when it eventually divides. There may be a threshold below which the repair mechanism is not activated in the body. Therefore, low levels of chronic radiation exposure can accumulate in the body without the repair system being activated. Radiological research and animal studies found a correlation between tritium and cumulative genetic injury. In successive generations, there was a reduction in relative brain weight, reduction in litter size, and increased reabsorption of embryos was found. Correlations were found in epidemiological research between tritium and Down syndrome. So let's talk about this waste and my community. Nuclear power must dispose of their waste to operate. For pressurized water reactors such as Rho, the main release is into a, a body of water. Thus, the Deerfield became a radiation waste dump. When tritium is released into such an environment, plants, animals, and human beings in the vicinity can be contaminated. As I said, the Deerfield's a small winding river. It has white water. In fact, it has white water rafting in the summer, and it is fast running. The valley through which the river runs is 800 feet high on either side, creating a tunnel where air inversions are trapped 34% of the time. Fog blankets a valley for days. And those inversions trap the radioactive waste into that tunnel. In, in addition to recreational use, schools, wells, and cropland are adjacent to the river. And in times of drought, river water is used to irrigate crops. 
every year 500,000 people use the Deerfield. For 31 years, the river was a dumping ground for radioactive waste. During the 60s and early 70s, Roe had problems with faulty fuel rods and dumped large amounts of tritium into the river. Up to 1,800 curies a year was released within NRC acceptable limits. I want you to think of those pictures of the children in that river and the issue of this waste. The estimated concentrations of tritium were 10,000 times greater in the Deerfield River Valley than outside the valley. There were batch releases each month. People in the community were unaware that the river was radioactive. Although as it had been noted that since the reactor opened, the river never froze. An analysis of the Deerfield done by graduate students at John Hopkins University from US Geological Service Studies raised serious questions concerning the migration of contamination from the river, the potential for wells in local towns to share water supplies with the Deerfield, and the potential for recharging. Recommendations were made to study evaporation of tritium, measure pollutant contaminations, and gain information on holding basins in the valley. Again, this is the broken promise of routine operation. After we forced the reactor shut down, its failed policy regarding nuclear waste was exposed. But you have to understand, none of us understood that this toxic waste was in our river. In fact, the contamination on site of the, the Yankee site was so widespread that the site itself has yet to be released some 30 years later for what the NRC calls unrestricted use. There are plumes of tritium contamination that migrated 300 feet down into the groundwater. Some of these radioactive plumes contaminated the river. Once the reactor shuttered, the corporation announced it would ship its low level waste over 900 miles to Barnwell, South Carolina, a 46% working poor black community. How could we accept that the waste that hurt us could hurt another? We fought those shipments, raising awareness about the industry's environmental racism we held three caravan of conscience tours to Barnwell, South Carolina, to protest the shipments and make visible the invisible. And in the meanwhile, during decommissioning, the corporation continued to contaminate our river with radioactive waste. We decided that we had to try and stop it from contaminating our river or anyone else's community. Yankee Atomic submitted a 300 page decommissioning plan seeking approval for, from the NRC before decommissioning could commence. Instead of waiting for the agency approval, it began a rapid dismantlement of the reactor, basically stripping and shipping the waste to South Carolina. NRC hadn't approved the plan, yet the agency was permitting the corporation to remove highly contaminated components without adequate review or oversight. We were outraged. We couldn't accept that the, N the NRC evading its own rules and regulations to protect this corporation. We took NRC to court to get an injunction against their stripping and shipping. First, the district court turned us down over our request, allowing Yankee to continue to strip and ship However, Judge Ponzer wrote a telling opinion that holds to this day in terms of decommissioning. The court makes this decision with a heavy heart. 
The plaintiffs have been diligently attempting for once to get a hearing on the appropriateness and competence of the NRC's actions. Many of them live near the site of the decommissioned nuclear plant. <coughs> they and their families are most directly at risk if the job of removing contaminated materials is bungled. Moreover, moreover if they do suffer harm, its full extent may not be known for years or decades. This course of conduct suggests a concerted bureaucratic effort to thwart the efforts of local citizens to be heard about an event that vitally affects them and their children. It calls to mind the activities of Charles Dickens' fictional office of circumlocution in Bleak House. The prospect that this tactic may be used nationally as more nuclear plants shut down and more local citizens express concern about the impact of the process on their lives is, to put it mildly, disquieting. It would seem no more than simple fairness as a matter of policy, if not of strict law, to give local people the opportunity to be heard when something of this magnitude occurs in their community. If they're not to be given any voice, community members at least have a right to be told why promptly and clearly and by some disinterested adjudicatory body. Can appeal to the First Circuit Appellate Court. The First Circuit found in our favor finding NRC in violation of the National Environmental Policy Act, the Administrative Procedures Act, and the Atomic Energy Act. We got the hearing we fought for, but by then 140,000 curies of waste had been shipped to Barnwell, South Carolina. While we wound our way through the court, NRC rewrote their rules to make legal what was illegal. We maintain that the NRC remains in violation of the appellate court decision and must engage in a rulemaking that addresses the court's concerns. So what did the illegal decommissioning of Roe accomplish? When Yankees sought approval for siting the reactor, it promised that when Roe shuttered, the site would be returned to its original beauty. All the waste would be removed, the site would be released for unrestricted use. The Atomic Energy Act and the National Environmental Policy Act required that the NRC take the role of regulator with response to decommissioning. None of this was true. Decommissioning demonstrates the colossal failure of nuclear power. Nuclear reactors are toxic waste dumps. The sites are contaminated with radioactive and chemical waste. And cleanup costs skyrocket as surveys uncover greater plumes of contamination. Now, decommissioning before Yankee Row was very different. It was classified as a major federal action under the National Environmental Policy Act. It required oversight by NRC and the EPA. Licensees had to submit detailed decommissioning plans before cleanup. On-site residence inspectors were required and there were NRC hearings available to petitioners who needed to question what the NRC and the corporation was doing to protect the health and safety of their community. So, since Roe, what we have is deregulated decommissioning. No longer is decommissioning considered a federal, major federal action, so there are no detailed decommissioning plans, no on-site resident inspectors. There's limited oversight and review, and now corporations can strip and ship components with a 30-page document. And they don't have to put in writing any of the commitments they make in terms of cleanup. And there are no hearings, basically. 
So does it matter? Are there dangers in the rapid dismantlement? So as I said, there's no EPA oversight. There's greater worker exposure and less worker protection. Sites are frequently contaminated with hot particles during the cutting up of the internals and those hot particle particles can migrate off site. There is at times a loss of control, radiological control. At Connecticut Yankee, they gave uh, bricks to a local daycare center to use and those bricks were radioactive and they had to take them back. It's, it's very painful. There are higher cleanup costs and because there are higher cleanup costs, there's also more waste. And when there's more waste, what we're also dealing with is environmental racism because the communities that are the most invisible are the dump communities. They get the least attention and they suffer the consequences of the end result of nuclear power. So CAN developed a model for decommissioning, a thorough and responsible approach. We've also submitted comments in response to the NRC's re repeated reworking of decommissioning basically to continue to deregulate it. We believe the NRC must resume its responsibility for oversight of cleanup operations and propose a new set of regulations specifically for decommissioning and for post-operational spent fuel storage. They have to be in compliance with the Atomic Energy Act and NEPA. And they have to, the NRC has to create a set of standards that apply specifically to decommissioning, which they do not have at this time. And as I said, we believe the NRC is still in violation of that appellate court decision. So this is the broken promise of cleanup. Now I wanna give a very brief look at what CAN's model for a thorough and uh, responsible decommissioning involves. It can go anywhere from eight to 30 years in terms of dealing with the waste. It can begin immediately about enclosure though. It retains a skilled workforce that have the institutional memory to understand where the problems at the reactor site in terms of pollution are. It, you can transfer the high level waste to hardened dry cast storage right away. You can commence site surveying of groundwater contamination, remove non-essential buildings, have routine radiological inspections, have site environmental and radiation monitoring programs and develop decontamination and dismantlement plan. And the issue in this is even though this takes longer and some communities have been in conflict about it, the reality is it's safer and it's safer for the reactor community and it is certainly safer for any dump community. For example, with Roe, if those 140,000 curies that they sent down to Barnwell, South Carolina, if they had waited 30 years, they would have decreased by an order, one order of magnitude. They would have only shipped 14,000 curies. And that's a very big difference. So I will briefly give some sense of recommendations for what should happen. For decommissioning to have any meaning whatsoever. They have to provide for meaningful opportunity for an adjudicatory hearing on all decommissioning activities, make clear distinctions, as I've said, between decommissioning and spent fuel storage, and set clear, specific, and comprehensive standards for decommissioning activities that protect the public health and safety. And of course, reinstate NEPA compliance. Oh, so, Let's talk about the crisis and high-level waste now. 
What remains at row? 40 million curies of high level waste on the sites, on the banks of that river with no destination and no solution. The industry's plan? creating temporary storage 2,000 miles away in Andrews County in Texas. This waste will be dangerous for a million years. This is the colossal failure of nuclear power. There is no present solution to deal with the brutal legacy of Yankee Row or any other reactor. This is the abject failure of the nuclear industry and the federal government. When Yankee Atomic approached the town of Roe and the state of Massachusetts, it committed to removal of all the waste from the site. There would be a solution for the highly dangerous, high-level waste that the operation of the reactor created. 60 years later, there is no solution and no permanent solution forthcoming. There is waste with nowhere to go. A Blue Ribbon Commission commissioned by President Obama was impaneled to take testimony from citizens about their concerns. Did they come to my community or near the New England communities checkered with nuclear reactors? No, it was held in Wiscasset, Maine, the furthest away from all New England reactors. We organized public participation, traveled four hours each way to testify about our concerns and our betrayal. We raised the issues of the broken promises, the vulnerability of the fuel pools, dry cast storage, the need to harden the cast in a post 9-11 world. We raised the National Academy of Science report that acknowledged that reactor fuel pools were vulnerable to acts of malice their advisory that the fuel should be transferred to dry cast storage and that casts themselves should be protected. These recommendations were communicated to the NRC. What did the NRC do? Nothing. What did the Blue Ribbon Commission recommend to address the concerns of rec reactor communities? Nothing. What was accomplished? A promotion of nuclear power without addressing the abdication by the nuclear industry or the federal government to address the monstrous waste problem they created. But it did, did recommend fell far short of what reactive communities need. Instead, it advocated for interim storage, consent-based siting, albeit developed by an independent body and lip service to a permanent solution. What has the government done to address these recommendations? Just about nothing except putting the DOE in charge of hearing people's concerns regarding consent. Is the DOE an independent body? And the industry? It's moving forward tar targeting working poor Hispanic communities in the Southwest, overwhelmingly opposed by state and local government alike. How is that for consent? This is environmental racism. It is reprehensible. The nuclear industry targets working poor, people of color and indigenous tribes for its nuclear fuel chain. It pits reactor and targeted communities against each other over who will suffer nuclear power's final solution. For the DOE and the industry to focus on consent and interim storage continues their abdication to develop a scientifically sound and environmentally just solution to this monstrous problem. Our monstrous problem. Why would any reactor or targeted community give them, believe them, given their abject failure? Citizens Awareness Network opposes these false solutions. Without a permanent repository, any establishment of centralized interim storage is merely a way to make the industry's waste problem disappear. <clears throat> Potentially, it will de facto become the industry's permanent solution. We can't accept that another community will suffer to clean our community up. We accept that the waste must remain on site until the government does its job. This isn't easy. 
dangers remain. The crisis in waste exposes more of the nuclear power's broken promises. And then there are acts of malice post 9-11 and climate disruption. As I mentioned, 40 million curious of high level waste sit on the banks of the Deerfield River. Is that a problem? Maybe 40 million curious isn't a big deal. To give you a comparison, a hospital has on hand to do all the cancer treatments, as well as research, three to five curies a year. 40 million curies, a lot of dangerous waste. This waste must be isolated for, from the environment for 10,000 years. It will be dangerous for over a million. We can't even imagine a sign that could be created that people 200 years from now could understand to explain the dangers. There are fears that the casts are vulnerable to acts of malice. As I've said, the canisters sit in the open on a pad on the banks of the river. The National Governors Council stated that the high-level nuclear waste at reactor sites were pre-deployed weapons of mass destruction. It urged Congress to take action to protect these sites. Congress has yet to act. NRC refuses to harden the waste on site. Why? To harden the waste acknowledges that they are vulnerable to acts of malice. <clears throat> we were suing Connecticut Yankee over the cleanup at that site around decommissioning. And we were at a meeting with the lawyer for Connecticut Yankee and the EPA was there and it was just post 9-11. And I said, what are you gonna do with the waste? How are you gonna protect it? It's sitting out there on a pad. And the lawyer turned to me and he said, when you have a problem and you don't have a solution, then you don't have a problem. And now there's climate change. Again, the high level waste canisters sit on the banks of the river. Above it are two dams the Sherman Dam and the Harriman Reservoir. Harriman is over 2,000 acres. It has a spillway to deal with flooding. In Hurricane Irene, the workers repeatedly released water through the spillway, fearing the dam would break, driving a 20-foot wall of water down into the valley, including our town's nuclear waste canisters. This could leave our valley uninhabitable for decades. The National Academy of Science in February began a study to address what it calls PMP events, probability of maximum precipitation events. The study focuses on infrastructure, dams, energy generation, including nuclear sites. It addresses their vulnerability to these PMP events. Included in the study are representatives from FERC and NRC, both acknowledge that there is no guidance in place to direct their actions to address these events and the vulnerability of these sites. FERC and USGS acknowledge that they were 20 years behind the curve in addressing these issues. NRC acknowledged that the agency's concerns were raised in response to the Fukushima accident. We live with a ticking clock of disaster and no one hears it, but the communities bearing the burden. For all its claims, nuclear power is neither clean nor green. It is a dirty, toxic technology. It relies on its invisibility to keep its lies going. When its lies fail, its intimidation fails, it falls back on a captive regulator to protect it. Clean water, clean air, clean land, and a safe place to live are our right. CAN fights for the cleanup of all communities. We work to stop the targeting of black, brown, and white communities alike to nuclear contamination. 
Citizens Awareness Network wakes people up in a world that wants them to stay asleep. I'm here to wake you up to our plight. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Um, I'm not sure what anyone else is feeling, but I know this is very likely going to stay with me for a while and is obviously a lot to think about, but thank you for talking about it, even though it is obviously, I'm sure, hard to talk about. Um, I'm going to add your website to the chat so we can encourage folks to check it out and support Deb's work and the fantastic things they're doing over in New England. Um, okay, so we will be entering the question portion of this evening. Um, if you have questions, you can type them in the chat or raise your hand and um, Jeremy will read, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jeremy will read questions received via email. Please keep your verbal questions and remarks to under a minute so we can get through all our questions. Um, if there is time, you are welcome to ask additional ones. All right, I'll, I'll start off with one question. I uh, thank you very much for the talk. It was frighteningly. Uh, informative um we hear a lot about jobs like the nuclear industry bring in high paying jobs to a region um did you find that to be the case in the plant that you were at and also when um when the plant left did that affect the economy in a negative way so they created it was interesting because the town of Roe before the reactor opened couldn't plow its own roads. It didn't have the money. Some of our roads had to close actually in winter. And others, they got other towns to come in because it was so poor. So they did, they brought in workers, they gave them middle-class income, something that the community didn't have. Um, Franklin County, where Roe is, is the sixth poorest county in New England. So, and in a certain way, they created a false economy that went on and there were jobs that were lost, but some people moved on to Vermont Yankee, which was only 16 miles away. And the reality is they brought in people, a lot of people during decommissioning that kept mo money flowing in. And there were a lot of people who moved back after the reactor shuttered because they wouldn't live there. They didn't feel it was safe. So it's actually become much more of a recreational center for the whole valley. I mean, Roe is a town with 300 people, you know. You drive at 20 miles an hour, you don't even know you've been there. But it's a whole valley that was affected in terms of finances, a whole valley that was affected in terms of the waste. So, But it's actually got restaurants now. It, it's in certain ways doing, it's not doing worse than it was, so. But it's, an, I, I have to, it's true, it's a loss. There's no doubt it's a loss, but workers can get retrained and they can do other things. And nothing lasts forever. I just I just one question just to um to tail off that. You said they brought in workers. Did yeah. they bring in more workers and they hired locally or just curious? They had some local workers. There have been workers. I mean, a lot of the workers were enraged with us and gave us a very bad time in the process of closing the reactor, and some still do. Some of the workers have come to us, come to me later to thank me because they wound up realizing they had been exposed during the cleanup because they brought in what the industry calls sponges who go from one reactor site to another site, and they get pick up a bunch of, rate, you know, doses of radiation, but their exposure doesn't travel to the next site. 
so they can actually continue to work. So there were times, I think, when they may have even had 800 workers on site, which was more than the, the number of workers they had when it was operating. But in a certain way, it was a company town. They bought local, but they controlled it then. And they controlled what got talked about. So no one felt safe complaining about the reactor in public. People would give us information about people who were sick in the community. And they said, please don't use my name. Please don't say that you got this from me because they'll ostracize me. So that there was, as I said, this thin veneer of civility, but underneath there were real threats and violence that went on. My, they tried to run my husband off the road. He was coming back with the mock high level waste cast trying to see Bernie Sanders in Vermont. And this guy just tailed him and tried to push him off the road with the cast. And this is also the invisible of what goes on in these communities when you oppose them. It's not so sweet. I think Jeremy might have another related question on his list. I think one came in about like, um, how did you talk to the workers and and uh, was did they feel like they were going to be retaliated against? What what was the question, Jeremy? Yeah, it was that. Um, how how did you um, start conversations with workers, and um, were people worried about retaliation? Was kind of what you've covered. I well, we I mean the workers were furious, a lot of them, and uh, and they expressed it very directly through harassing people. What also happened though, was we in our lawsuit represented the security guards on site because we talked about the conditions that they were working in and the exposures they could be ha having so that in some ways the response of the workers became more fragmented because of that. It wasn't as clear. And also the workers that came in for decommissioning didn't have a connection to the community. So they didn't care in, in a certain way. They were just sort of gladiators coming in to work at the site. And a lot of the people who live locally, some of them moved, some of them worked at Vermont Yankee, a lot of them stayed in New England. But there's no doubt that is painful. That's true. It's it's not easy. And we we acknowledge that and we supported worker training. There are a lot of things that we attempted to do. I still have people who throw trash in my driveway. This is 30 years later, and I still have people throw trash in my driveway. You got a question from the chat. How do they sleep at night? <laughs> Who, them or me? <laughs> Bill, who are we talking about? How do they sleep at night? I, they drink. <laughs> they figure it out. I, you know, we sort of adjusted. I mean, it was my kids got targeted at schools in ways. I mean, it was. You know, it was like we tried to hand out literature in row, which was, you know, we were so stupid in a way, you know, we and they looked as if we were trying to hand out pornography. And, you know, the the town in a certain way, there are many people in the town who have yet to forgive me for what I've done. But a lot of other people have been very grateful. But you learn not to be caught in it. The right. nuclear, yes. Yeah. You just qualified his question, the nuclear industry doing this. Um, yes. How did they sleep? A lot of I money. <laughs> they sleep 
they it's all abstract to them you see that's why i talked about making the invisible visible that's why i talked about the children with down syndrome not as statistics but as what their lives were like because if you can live in the abstract then you can do anything because you have no sense of the consequences you have no sense of the suffering you have no sense of the cost of what you're doing. And so they sleep well at night because they don't have to take a kid with Down syndrome to uh, to get their teeth cleaned and have to struggle over it because of how sick they may get in the process of it. They don't have to tro struggle with a husband who's dying of a brain tumor. They're, they're walled off from all of it. So they sleep well, Bill. What else do you have, Jeremy? Well, um, I have a question about the, you're talking about the dams and the reservoirs and stuff. Um, as we all know, a lot of our infrastructure is aged, <laughs> to say the least. Um, how long has that, because it looked like it was an earthen dam, so how long has that dam and reservoir been there? Do you know the last time it was upgraded? Uh, or... Oh, well, you, one of the things, there were a couple of things. It's worth seeing this first talk by the NAS about the study. I mean, the dam was built in the 30s. It's been there. It actually was sort of a, a marvel because it has what's called a glory hole. This, I think Veronique had the pictures up of it where it has this spillway that where all the water basically siphons down. Um, what I can say is dam repair and dam re inspections are few and far between not just in Massachusetts, but in fact, two of the uh, people who were on the committee or on this discussion of this study, one was I think from Louisiana and the other was from a state in the Midwest, Ohio. And they were inspectors. They worked to inspect dams and everything. And, and in Louisiana, they have six inspectors and they have 700 dams to inspect. And that gives you a sense of the problem of what we're looking at in terms of infrastructure and the issue of these maximum precipitation events and how they're clueless about what can actually happen. Um, there's a comment in the chat um, uh, from Mitchell. Uh, New Englanders have their work cut out for them. Millstone nuclear power plant is heavily subsidized, and there is a General Dynamics electric boat nearby, a submarine. Yeah. Manufacturer. Seabrook nuclear, nuclear power plant has severe problems with alkali silica reaction. Yeah. Yes, it's true. And Massachusetts, in fact, is surrounded by four nukes, three downed, one operating, but in fact, the issues of security for that little state, as well as the issues of climate disruption are very powerful. And yes, in Connecticut, where we shuttered one of the nukes, but the Millstone two and three are operating and uh, are not looking like they're going to necessarily shutter. There isn't a lot of work going on in Connecticut. We've tried a couple of times. We were originally involved there in the in the 2000s, shutting down, or late 1990s, shutting Connecticut Yankee and Millstone One with other groups. But then they got so disheartened by the issues that came up against that uh, it's been really dry there. And there's a lot of work around Seabrook and we have people around Seabrook as well. But yeah, there's a lot of work yet and there are a lot of reactors and the downed reactors are just high level nuclear waste dumps. So we basically have nine high level nuclear waste dumps in little New England. 
all with 40 million curies, 35 million curies, 30 million curies sitting either in fuel pools or out on pads. I know during your talk, you talked about um, how it affected the wildlife and the plants and how it just, um, have you seen, or has there been anything done to, about if any of that's coming back or, you, or is it, yeah. They wouldn't study it. I mean, we found all of this stuff. We pushed them to study it. We got them to look at the epidemic of disease but they didn't want to go any further because they don't want to know. Look, Massachusetts is the only state that has done three health studies around nuclear facilities. One around Roe, one around Pilgrim, and one around nuclear metals, which is in Concord. And nuclear metals was involved in, I think, making the triggers, the tritium triggers for the military. Every one of them has statistical significance in cancer. Every one of them. Now, there are many reasons. One, the state doesn't have a lot of money to deal with this. And there's a way that there is, because it's just standard operation, it doesn't matter. I mean, there's work going on around Chernobyl and the wolves and the wildlife and Although they're sort of so happy about the wolves coming back or being there, the birds are dying off. There, there's a whole shifting of mutations and what's happening in all of this. But they didn't do it. We wanted them to take, you know, do testing of animals to see what was in the wildlife. Because, of course, they would, because they're closer to the ground uptake the tritium and other radionuclides. But in a certain way, they don't want to know because if they know, then they have to do something. And as far as like rehabilitating the area, even if they don't study the effects of what they've done, have they, they said, you said in your talk that they were going to make it back to normal or better than it used to be or whatever. <laughs> Well, they can't because there's that high level waste sitting there by the, the river. So, I mean, they've taken a lot of the buildings down. I mean, Yankee has 2,000 acres. It's a big site. It's un, in some ways unusual. It has 16 canisters on it. But, I mean, you've got to understand where I, I live in a forest. I mean, the reactor site is surrounded, as you've seen in the pictures, by forests. This is an empty area, you know. There aren't no, um, there's no public water. There are no lights. There are dirt roads, you know. I, before fighting and getting engaged in all of this, I, I never exactly considered myself working poor <laughs> until I started reading how they describe working poor. And I said, oh, that's me. I just thought, you know, I lived this sort of simple life. And for, to me, it's a beautiful, rich life, but it doesn't have a lot of the amenities. So the wildlife is there. There are a lot of turkeys, deer, moose. It's empty. And that's one of the reasons they chose it, because they can't put nukes in cities. So they started by putting them in places where if they lost the reactor, it wouldn't be a lot of people. There have been a lot of high profile people coming out supporting different new nuclear, like, you know, Bill Gates is a good example. And the testing different things. If yeah. you could show them one thing, what would, what would you would like to show them? Well, God. Well, it would be to have people tell Gates the stories of how they've been sacrificed. It wouldn't be one thing. 
It would be the story of the sacrificed people through the fuel chain. And is he willing to engage in human sacrifice to make power? And he could say, yes, I'm willing for all of these people to suffer, to have lives broken and rent so that I can turn on my lights. And he could say that, and I wouldn't be happy with it, but that would be real. But people have to acknowledge what they're doing and take responsibility. So if you're willing to engage in human sacrifice, then you'll go ahead. And if you're not, then you're going to have to really think this through in a different way to at least hurt as few people as possible by whatever we do. I mean, this waste can't stay at reactor sites forever. It can't do it. I mean, for many reasons. It can't be by water. It's too dangerous over the long haul besides these PMP events. And there's the issue of, you know, uh, terrorists getting their hands on it. The issue of um, militarization. In a certain way, this waste needs to be buried if possible, somewhere where no one can get it. I don't know if that's feasible, but nobody should be able to use it again for anything. And that will potentially include some sacrifice, which is just terrible. But at least it could be informed, actually informed, whether you want to risk this, whether you're willing to take it on or not, rather than the the shuck and jive that the industry engages in. Does anybody have any questions from the audience or um, are there any more questions that were emailed in? Oh, we've got, can you, can you address reactor life operations? Oh, well, they're just, you know, they can't build any new nukes. That's the problem, right? There isn't a community, even though people are for nuclear power, they're for it until they say, well, we're going to build it in your community. <laughs> and then they're not for it anymore. You know, it's like drug treatment centers. We're all for drug treatment centers, but we're going to put it on your block. No, I don't want it on my block. And the same is true for nuclear. They want as long as it's not going to be near them. It's the abstract. So they can't build any new nukes. And if they ever get to build new nukes, it'll be on old sites for the most part because nobody wants it by them. So what they have to do is extend the licenses of the reactors that they have because they can't do anything else. I mean, they keep putting up these signs, the Renaissance is coming, the Renaissance is coming. It's been coming for 30 years and they're, they're, they're not there. You know, and the SMRs and all of that haven't actually happened. And and they're just potentially another pipe dream, but of this dirty industry that is basically dying, but like a vampire comes back again and again, again and again, unless you're vigilant, unless you're vigilant. Yeah, I think they've had 70 years or more to figure out the waste problem. And, um, you know, they can just, you know, roll out the next shiny thing and get us excited about it, I guess. Say it's well, gonna... distraction. Yeah, yeah. To distract us. Yeah. They seem to jump on the, they're jumping on the climate crisis now. Well, they're, it's effective. They're trying to claim they're clean and green. And the only way they can do that is by contaminating America. But because they're invi it's invisible, then they can get away with it un unless people like us speak up and say, it's not, it's not clean, it's not green, it's really toxic, it makes you sick. 
causes untold suffering for communities. Does anyone else have any questions? Or, um, oh yeah, Bill, um, a core, um, per your note in the chat um, about having a copy of the presentation, this is being recorded and we will be sending it out to the registrants of yeah. this meeting. So yeah, and also if you wanted to watch any of our previous nuclear fuel chain sessions, um, they are available on the Snake River Alliance YouTube page. Um, and we'll send that out in like a thank you. I don't know. We can we can include that in the thank you email after this. Oh, um, Marlene, if you want to speak. I'm a longtime Vermonter, way back when. And uh, I remember when I was a youngster that you were down in the Vermont Yankee area and you've been so faithful to this struggle. Um, mm. I'm now living in Albuquerque and I'm dealing with <laughs> the uranium cycle, but I always kept you in my mind and in my prayers because of the tremendous work that you have sustained a long time. And I can remember one testimony with VPIRG when they wanted to put the the question was embedding the waste in the granite right. or shooting it up into space. But yes. Deb, I wanted I want to really honor you for the commitment that you have done and on behalf of all of us. Thank you. Well thank you. It's a dirty job, but someone's got to do it, you know. It is a dirty job. Yeah. No, everybody, don't look so miserable. You know, the danger in these discussions is by the end of it, everyone needs to go get a drink, including me. And that won't help. I mean, so let me try to shift this around before we end in a certain way, which is, look, can shut four nukes. We helped in a certain way stop, you know, Barnwell from taking waste from all of the reactors across the country. You know, we also you shut Vermont Yankee and we're fighting still. And the job is to risk fighting. I mean, the work at this point is that like the climate movement is like a giant vacuum sucking up all the money and all the energy in the world. And the trouble is not that the, the problem isn't real, but that the problem is more complicated. It's nukes and climate. It's, it's all part of the same thing. And part of our work is to reach out to our sisters and brothers who were in the climate movement and get them to understand these people who live in the abstract world that nukes are no answer and that our job is not to fight each other over what's worst, but to fight together for what's best. And that's our job now is to fight for what's best and to do that as a unified, not just anti-nuclear community, but a unified environmental community. And that's part of where our work needs to go, which is to go to that broader community, to farming communities, to so that they can understand, well, if, with climate disruption, if dumps are flooded, what's going to happen to that waste? It's going to go on farmland in all likelihood. It's going to contaminate communities. And so it's making the invisible visible. That's why, that's what we talk about now at CAN. It's making the invisible visible. And we can all do it. It's, it's the work. And it can be a lot of fun as well. So don't be grim. Got to buck up. Get out there. Make trouble. <laughs> Good trouble. Good trouble. Yes. Thank you, Deb. Oh, yeah. you're welcome. And, you know, we had Bill come up to Vermont years ago. 
years ago when we had our camp, one of our action camps, and we had Bill come up and we tried to get him a meeting with Bernie Sanders because they were targeting Bill's community for the waste dump. That was one of the first places they chose. We did get and, to talk to him. Yeah, no, he wouldn't talk to you. He was such a son of a bitch, you know. He's but, very but good listen, now but, about everything. Yeah, he's a good but, man. He's a good man, but listen, Deb, he uh, did meet with some friends of mine. Yeah. And, you know, he was a sponsor of this compact with Maine and Vermont that would yes. send radioactive waste to my home in Sierra Blanca for $50 million in dumping fees. I know. And, I and know. He, was, he was saying, I got to do it because they'll vote me out of office. You know, like he was real adamant of staying as a sponsor of the compact, you know. I would, know. Look, would... <laughs> he we we brought our high level waste cask up to his office. Right. And he threw us out of there. <laughs> he didn't want us anyone there. Sanders was for the reactor before he was against it. And he wouldn't meet, we had this whole delegation from Texas to meet with him and he refused to meet with them. It was so outrageous. It was such hubris on his part. But, but, I was but always did, sorry for that. But we did take out a good ad in, the, in one of the main papers yeah. slamming him. It was a pretty yeah. good ad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, uh, Politicians, what are you going to do? Uh, 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 real quick, real quick, Debbie, I'll never forget the uh, photo that you sent me back in the, I guess it was 97 or 98 or maybe before, of the steam generator that was being decommissioned and sent yeah. down the highway to yeah. Barnwell. And y'all had shame with signs yeah. with shame and anguish, uh, you know, of, of how sad it was for them to be dumping on Barnwell. You know, I yeah. missed it. Well, on a state sponsored tour, right. it was really, really bad. I saw it things that were amazing. Yeah. What I've been to Barnwell. I've been to Barnwell as well. I know. You know, we uh we went down there and we had these black limousines following us that didn't have license plates on our caravan of conscience tour, and they were following us. We had a helicopter overhead, and we actually went to the cemetery in Barnwell because one of our organizers' family had come from Snelling, which is the town where Barnwell is, and had donated the land to that the dump is on for a park but that the town turned into the dump. So we went to see his relatives and we get there and the DOD are there with submachine guns standing at the, uh, at the grave, ostensibly to protect us. This is the underbelly. This is the invisibility of what organizing it is about not just I mean we got death threats up here they tried to run us off the road but this is what a dump community faces you see we entered a dump community and this is the level of terrorization they experience and they are up against and this is all hidden this is all hidden. And that's what they get away with again and again. And it's reprehensible. Thank you, Deb. Um, all right, uh, we are gonna wrap things up now. Um, I'm sure I speak for everyone, but this, well, and also Deb, I know you don't want people to be so glib, but I think that that's a credit to your presenting style and storytelling it makes you feel as though you are at Yankee like I've I felt the pain I felt the loss and I think that that's a testament to how you transport people there and I think that's very important because a lot of issues like this people don't want to have an action unless it impacts them directly um, but 
enough about my little tangent. I will. Um... No, I think what you're saying is really important. I just want to say this for everyone, because I think it's really important. Facts do not change anyone's mind. Repeat after me. Facts do not change anyone's mind. Stories do. Mm. Stories do. Stories that can move people make them think, make them connect to something that goes beyond that abstract idea in their brain. And that's what you're working to do is to get to break through that 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 abstract world for them to have to feel something, to, to experience it. And that comes from stories and storytelling. So, Thank you. Um, all right. Um, thank you, Deb, for taking the time to speak with us and sharing your story. Um, and thank Veronique. She did all oh, yeah. the technical thank, thank work. Veronique for her <laughs> technical help and doing more of the um, background. I don't behind the scenes, behind the scenes work to make sure this presentation went off without a hitch. Um, I would also like to thank all of you for your interest and for joining us tonight. It's important that we learn more and make responsible moral energy choices. If you would like to support these lectures and learn more about Snake River Alliance, um, please um, go to snakeriverlines.org where you can join a mailing list to receive an invitation to the next lecture in our fuel chain series. And then also please save the chat if you'd like and we will post the video to our event calendar and our YouTube page as soon as possible. I hope everyone has a great night. And again, thank you for attending and thank you, Deb, for your- And make them miserable and enjoy it. <laughs>